بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه حضرة صاحب السمو الشيخ الدكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي عضو المجلس الأعلى حاكم إمارة الشارقة حفظكم الله ورعاكم أصحاب المعالي أصحاب السعادة رؤساء الجامعات السادة وفد مؤسسة كارنيجي لتطوير التعليم ضيوفنا الأفاضل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا بكم في إمارة العلم والثقافة أهلا بكم في أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم صاحب السمو هذا يوم تزدان فيه أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم برعايتكم الكريمة وحضوركم بيننا ملهما وراعيا للعلم والمتعلمين فأهلا وسهلا بسموكم ضيوفنا الكرام نجتمع اليوم تحت قبة الأكاديمية وعبر فضائها الرقمي الذي يضم حتى هذه اللحظة أكثر من ثلاثين مؤسسة تعليمية رائدة وجامعة عريقة بما فيها جامعة هلسنكي جامعة موناش جامعة هارفارد ومنظمة البكالوريا الدولية وأكثر من مئتي خبير تطوير وقيادي تربوي من أجل هدف واحد ألا وهو تطوير التعليم وبناء جيل مؤهل قادر على قيادة المستقبل والآن نترككم مع هذا العرض المرئي لإنجازات أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم شكلت أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم نهجا علميا نوعيا باعتبارها سرح علم أبوابه مشرعة ونوافذه مفتوحة تجاه اختزال حضارات العالم أجمع تشهد قبة الأكاديمية على آفاق علمية تبنى ومنجزات معرفية تتراكم خبراتها في تبصر وتدقيق وتحليل واستحضار للواقع العلمي استقبلت الأكاديمية أكثر من 400 معلم في مادتي الرياضيات والعلوم من خلال برامج طموحة بنيت وفق معايير عالمية في سنغافورة أشكر أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم لإتاحة الفرصة لنا لتجربة هذه المنصة وكل تفاؤل بنجاح هذه المنصة للارتقاء وإثراء تعليم مادة صعبة مثل مادة الرياضيات كما استطاعت الأكاديمية أن تعبر ببوابتها الرقمية حدود الزمان والمكان لتطرح برنامج التقصي الوبائي بالتعاون مع جامعة جون هوبكنز لتحول الجائحة من محنة إلى منحة في إطار تمكين ما يزيد عن عشرة آلاف معلم وطالب تعلمنا قانون مواجهة التحديات بسبب هذه الجائحة مما زاد من الإصرار والعزيمة لمواجهة الصعوبات والتحديات وتعالت الأكاديمية تطورا باحتضان حزمة من برامج محورها جودة الطلبة ورعايتهم وعلى رأس هذه الحزمة بالعربية نرتقي التي احتضنت اللسان العربي في أسمى معاني جاءت أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم لتروي ظمأ المعلمات والمعلمين فبدأت بسقي بذور معلم وأفتخر من هذا البحر العظيم الذي تكونت قطراته قطرة قطرة من خبرات السنين وعقول المعلمين لقد عانقت الأكاديمية ما يربو على 125 من البرامج النوعية ذات الأثر العميق ولامست أكثر من 100 ألف مستفيد في وايد أشياء مهمة تعلمتها من هالبرنامج بس اللي أحب بس اللي أشوفه أنه أهم شيء كيف أربط اللي درسته بالواقع يعني مو مجرد نظريات نحفظها ولكن نطبقها من محترفين تربويين كيف طبقوها في فنلندا. This program has indeed helped us over the past six weeks to become innovative 21st century teachers. It has also helped us to be able to manage the academic emotions that we are facing with our students on a day-to-day basis. It has helped us to become socially competent teachers to deal with the different challenges we are facing in the classes. This course is a great opportunity for me as a teacher to get the latest information in education and teaching. وتستمر الأكاديمية في رحلة عطائها على أرض واحتنا الظليلة في شارقة العلم برعاية صاحب السمو الشيخ الدكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي رعاه الله. 
وتمضي مسيرة العمل والعطاء من خلال أكاديمية تستشرف المستقبل وتجسد الواقع طموحا وتطورا وتحسينا وفق مؤشرات جودة عالمية تفوق التوقعات ندعو الآن الدكتورة جنين رومانو المدير التنفيذي لأكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم لإلقاء كلمتها فلتتفضل مشكورة سباكو good morning good morning your highness شيك دسم سلطان من حمد القاسمي supreme council member and ruler of Sharjah your excellency Dr. Ahmed Bakhol Al Balansi UAE Minister of Education your excellency Sarah Al Amari UAE Minister for State Public Education and Advanced Technology and Chairwoman of the Emirates Acad uh, School Establishment. Your Excellency Dr. Mahadatha Ahasami, President of Sharjah Education Academy and Chairperson of Sharjah Private Education Authority. Your Excellency as members of the Sharjah Education Academy Board of Trustees, distinguished guests and colleagues. Allah Asalam, welcome, welcome. It's so wonderful to be here. It's truly an honor and a joy to be a part of our first forum on education, opportunities and challenges. We are especially excited about our keynote speakers, our esteemed guests from the Carnegie Foundation for Advanced in Teachers, Advancement in Teachers who have come from the United States to join us today. We have Dr. Anthony Brick here, the former president, Dr. Paulo Halia, senior vice president, uh, Mr. Hwale Mania, or as we like to call him, Jojo, Senior Associate Managing Director for the Collaborative Technology at the Carnegie Foundation. And uh, Dr. Uh, Timothy Knowles will be joining us virtually, who is the current president. In addition, two members of our uh, Sharjah Education Academy Board of Trustees are keynote speakers today. We have Professor Pauline Taylor Guy, who's from the Acer Institute Australian Council of Educational Research, is here in person, and Professor Draga Gassin, Professor of Learning Analytics in the Faculty of Information Technology and Director of Center for Learning Analytics from Monash University, will be joining us online. Along with these distinguished keynote speakers, we have many, many additional guests speakers, presenters, who will be experts in the field of education who will be presenting in our breakout sessions. It's very exciting to be here. As we look around, I think you all see our vision is abundant everywhere. This is lead, innovate, and enable educational excellence in a diverse learning community. Not only is it all over the building and on our website and on all our email signatures, it's also embedded in our hearts. It is so important for us to be a part of this diverse learning community. I've been here in the academy since October, and as I look around today, I see so many friends that I've made in the last eight months, and they exemplify this vision that we have today to represent the diverse learning community. So not only do we have these amazing speakers, we have so many folks from the leadership here in Sharjah, and so many of our colleagues from our Sharjah Private Education Authority are here. It's lovely to see you. And 24 educational organizations are represented to here today. So thank you all for contributing to this vision. As many of you know, Sarge Education Academy consists of three streams. We have a professional development stream, an academic stream, and a research stream. So in 2020, during the pandemic, in response to our educators' needs to supporting regarding transferring of knowledge online, this academy was established. Through these streams, we have been offering and will continue to offer programs to empower professional learning communities that target both teachers and educational leaders. We have worked in cooperation with several distinguished universities and educational organizations, both local and international, including the American University of Sharjah, the University of Sharjah, John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, United States, and Kareen Rania Teaching Academy in Jordan. Since 2000, September 2021, we have had over 30 projects, 90 plus workshops, developed eight project 
effective news tools, and produced over 100 reports. All of this with a 97% overall satisfaction rate. These professional development programs for our teachers are the foundation that inspire our first collaboration with the University of Helsinki, Finland, Faculty of Education, to create our first postgraduate diploma in education. This program is a 24-hour level 8 program where 80% of the program is online and 20% is delivered face-to-face. -face. We just launched this program in January with 14 students, 13 in-service teacher and one pre-service teacher. I believe some of them are here today. If you're one of our students, if you could just wave so folks can see who you are. They, it's so good to see you guys. Uh, they've just finished their, successfully finished their first semester and they will complete the program next fall. So, so great to have you and thank you for being a part of our inaugural class. We're looking forward to having more students in the fall and our academy is honored and blessed to have the opportunity to empower the future Emirati teachers with 21st century skilled world-class qualifications to be the outstanding teachers that contribute to the development of the future generation in a special program called Proud to be a Teacher. Once again, thank you, Your Highness Sheikh Da Sultan Mohammed Al Qasemi, Supreme Council Member and Ruler of Sharjah, and Your Excellency, Dr. Mohadith Al Shami, for this opportunity to serve as the Executive Director of Sharjah Education Academy. I also want to thank all of you today not just for contributing for, to my learning, but to the learning of all our children. I know you are as passionate about education as I am. And a special thanks to my wonderful and patient Eric-speaking colleagues that have been contributing to my learning, definitely lifelong learning of trying to learn the Arabic language. And they have taught me how to say, Ana Ahib Bu Asharika. I love Sharjah. How did I do? Okay, <laughs> I'm working on my Arabic. I love it here. It's wonderful and it's so great to see so many of you here and our vision to enable an excellence in education. We really mean this from the bottom of our hearts and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here at Charge Education Academy. Thank you very much. Shukran <laughs> Dr. Janine ala ma tafaddalat bih. Nad'u al-an سعادة الدكتورة محدثة الهاشمي رئيس هيئة الشارقة للتعليم الخاص ورئيس أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم لإلقاء كلمتها فلتتفضل مشكورة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حضرة صاحب السمو الشيخ الدكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي عضو المجلس الأعلى حاكم إمارة الشارقة حفظكم الله ورعاكم معالي الأخت سارة الأميري وزيرة الدولة للتعليم العام والتكنولوجيا المتقدمة أصحاب السعادة رؤساء الجامعات حضرات الضيوف الأفاضل وفد مؤسسة كارنيجي للنهوض بالتعليم الزميلات والزملاء السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إنه لشرف عظيم لي أن أقف هنا يا صاحب السمو في دارتكم دارة العلم والعلماء في أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم التي تحظى بحضور سموكم بيننا وبرعايتكم الكريمة لمؤتمرنا التعليمي الأول مستقبل التعليم الفرص والتحديات والذي يحضره حشد من الأكاديميين والتربويين حضوريا وعن بعد واسمحوا لي يا صاحب السمو أن أستذكر معكم رحلة مدارس القطاع الخاص في إمارة الشارقة خلال الجائحة بدءا من اللحظة التي أغلقت كل المدارس أبوابها في شهر مارس لعام 2020 إلا أن المدارس في إمارة الشارقة استطاعت أن تحول هذه المحنة إلى فرصة وبدأت رحلة التحول نحو استدامة التعليم ونحو مدارس أكثر مرونة وقدرة على مواكبة جميع المستجدات والمتغيرات وإذ أستشهد بالمقال الذي نشره المجلس الإسترالي للبحوث 
والذي صنف مراحل التحول الرقمي التي تمر بها المدارس في العالم خلال أي جائحة إلى ثلاث مراحل والتي مرت بها مدارسنا بدءا من المرحلة الأولى حيث الاستجابة الفورية للإغلاق والتي فيها استمر التعليم دون توقف عبر منظومة التعليم عن بعد ثم المرحلة الثانية التي تحولت فيها المدارس من التعلم عن بعد إلى التعلم الهجين وصولا إلى مرحلة الاستدامة التي أصبح فيها التعليم والتعلم الحضوري مرنا مقترنا بالممارسة الرقمية كجزء لا يتجزأ من الحياة المدرسية وهذا ما أكدته نتائج تقييم منظومة التعليم عن بعد الموحدة على مستوى الدولة والذي نفذ في شهر مايو 2020 حيث أظهرت النتائج أن التعليم لم يتوقف في جميع مدارس الإمارة حيث حصلت 63% من مدارسنا على تقييم متطور في التعليم عن بعد وصاحب هذه الدراسة استطلاع رأي أجرته هيئة الشارقة للتعليم الخاص للشركاء الرئيسيين من أولياء الأمور والمعلمين والطلبة الذين أكدوا عن رضاهم على مستوى الخدمات التعليمية خلال الجائحة وبفضل تضافر الجهود من عدة جهات في الإمارة في مجابهة هذا الوباء فتحت المدارس أبوابها للطلبة مرة أخرى من بداية شهر سبتمبر 2020 وخاصة بعد أن ظفرت بثقة الأهالي وأولياء الأمور إذ الجائحة أكدت لنا جميعا أهمية دور المدرسة والمجتمع المدرسي في تلبية الحاجات النفسية وبناء الخبرات الاجتماعية ودروس الحياة الكبرى التي تستقى من الوجود الواقعي للطلبة داخل المدرسة واليوم وبعد عامين تستقبل مدارسنا جميع طلبتها حضوريا بأنظمة وممارسات متطورة معززة بالتركيز على جودة حياة الطلبة والتي ظهرت أهميتها أيضا خلال الجائحة كما وتأكدنا من أن المعلم هو الجندي الذي تصدى للأزمة وأنه هو من وقف في وجه الصعوبات وحول كل التحديات إلى نجاحات مما دفعنا في الهيئة إلى إعادة ترتيب أولوياتنا الاستراتيجية للسنوات الثلاث القادمة وفي الوقت الذي شكلت فيه الجائحة تحديا كبيرا للمعلمين تلقينا التوجيهات السامية منكم يا صاحب السمو بإطلاق أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم في شهر يوليو 2020 كأكاديمية مختصة بتدريب وتأهيل المعلمين والقيادات التربوية مما يؤكد حرص سموكم على ضرورة الاستمرار في الاستثمار في المعلم حيث كان المعلم خط الدفاع الأول خلال الجائحة وهو الذي أحدث الفرق في كل الأحوال ولو سألنا الطلبة ما الذي لن تنساه من هذه الجائحة سيقولون لن ننسى المعلم الذي اهتم بنا لن ننسى المعلم الذي حرص علينا وتابعنا ضيوفنا الكرام من على هذا المنبر لا يسعني إلا أن أستشهد بواحد من أقوال سموكم التي تعلمنا فيها حفظكم الله قيمة المعلم إذ تقول مهنة التعليم ليست بالمهنة اليسيرة فهي شاقة ونحن نعلم ذلك ولكن ثوابها كبير بإذن الله ويحظى المعلم بمكانة كبيرة وراقية لما يؤديه من رسالة مهمة ومحورية في بناء الأجيال وفي هذا المقام وتحت هذه القبة أستأذن سموكم بدعوة من هنا بيننا من معلمين وتربويين للوقوف ليصفق لهم الحضور إجلالا وتكريما شكرا لكم يا صاحب السمو حفظكم الله ورعاكم شكرا لكم حضورنا الكريم والشكر الأكبر لكلكم معلمينا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا لسعادة الدكتورة محدثة على ما تفضلت به صوت الطلبة صوت المستقبل نترككم الآن مع الطالب عبد الله الكعبي 
من مدرسة فيكتوريا الدولية الخاصة الصف السادس السلام عليكم and good morning يرهان الشيخ دكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي ruler of the Emirate of Sharjah may Allah protect you I am pleased and honored to share with you my educational experience at Victoria International School of Sharjah Central Region. Central Region. As a founding student of the school which opened this year, this Central Region is home to 320 students and 99% of whom are local immigrants. At our school, we learn in innovative and fun ways that are not limited to books, but using a new ad and adva advanced methods that are up, uh, up to date with our modern time and its requirements. We are not limited to the, the classroom. We use a last technology uh, to develop our skills and our parents also participate in developing these skills daily. At school this year, I was able to de develop my reading and writing skills in both Arabic and English. I speak, read, I speak, read, and write in both languages, which will help me ach achieve my future's goal. When I grow up, I hope to become a, mil a military pilot, saving my country and my community. I want to thank Your Highness for your care for, uh, care for us and your concern for your sons and daughters, providing everything we need uh, to excel and make our country a leading nation. May Allah please with you with honor and pride for us and the country and the Emirates, Emirates of Sharjah. صاحب السمو الشيخ دكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي حاكم إمارة الشارقة حفظه الله ورعاه يسعدني ويشرفني أن أشارككم تجربتي التعليمية في مدرسة فيكتوريا الدولية المنطقة الوسطى تحضرنا المد... مدرسة فيكتوريا المنطقة الوسطى 23 طالبا و99% منهم مواطنون إماراتيين إماراتيون نتعلم نتعلم في المدرسة بطرق شيقة وممتعة لا تقتصر على الكتب ولكن باستخدام أساليب حديثة ومتطورة تواكب العصر العصر ومتطلباته لا تقتصر فقط على الفصل الدراسي ولكن نستخدم أحدث التقنيات لتنمية مهاراتنا وكما أن الآباء أيضا يشاركون في تطوير هذه المهارات في المدرسة استطعت تطوير مهاراتي في القراءة والكتابة باللغتين العربية والإنجليزية أتحدث وأقرأ بال... بال... وأقرأ وأكتب باللغتين مما يساعدني عند... على تحقيق أهدافي المستقبلية عندما أكبر أتمنى أن أصبح طيارا عسكريا أخدم وطني ومجتمعي أريد أن أشكر, أشكر سموك على, رعاية... على رعايتك لنا واهتمامك بأبنائك وبناتك وتوفير كل ما يحتاجونه ليتميزوا ويجعلوا وطنهم في الريادة أدامك الله عزا وفخرا لنا وللوطن ولإمارة الشارع شكرا يا عبد الله صاحب السمو إن مؤسسة كارنيجي للنهوض بالتعليم مؤسسة عريقة تأسست في مطلع القرن الحالي للنهوض بالتعليم الجامعي ومعايير التعليم قامت بالتركيز في السبعينات على جودة التعليم المدرسي وأولويات التعليم وكان لها بصمات واضحة في مشاريع ومبادرات كثيرة للنهوض بالتعليم في جميع مجالاته وفي العديد من المؤسسات التعليمية في أمريكا بما فيها التعليم الطبي والآن ندعو كل من سعادة البروفيسور بول لومايو نائب الرئيس الأول في مؤسسة كارنيجي وسعادة البروفيسور أنتوني, الرئيس أنتوني بريكر الرئيس السابق لمؤسسة كارنيجي لإلقاء كلمتهما فليتفضل مشكورين. Good morning. Before I begin, I just my prepared remarks. I just want to start with a brief statement from the heart. I want to begin by thanking you, Your Highness, Your Excellency Dr. Muhadita, Your Excellency Dr. Janine, and Dr. Hunada for the invitation to spend time with you here this week. 
the open door to discussions about long-term partnership, I hope, to come, and the graciousness and warmth with which you've treated us in all of our time here. I want to begin, uh, you will hear over the next few minutes from three of us, myself, Dr. Anthony Breich, Tony Breich, friend and colleague, and Dr. Tim Knowles, the current president of the foundation. I will share with you a bit of the history and move us into the work that we're doing to, together these days, work that we may look to advance here in Sharjah, uh, in the Emirates, and ultimately beyond. Uh, and then we'll hear from Dr. Knowles, who will tell us about the future of the foundation in his view, under his leadership. So you'll get a taste of the past, the present, and the future. Carnegie Foundation was established in 1906 by an act of the United States Congress and with a very generous grant from Andrew Carnegie, the gentleman who at the time was the richest man on earth. And that grant totaled over half a billion dollars in today's money and was established to create a retirement system for teachers recognizing the teachers were not terribly well paid and there was absolutely no provision for their retirement. They had to work, as we say in America sometimes, until they dropped. And that was a situation that he was very concerned about and wanted to rectify. And so that was the first purpose of the Carnegie Foundation. Over that 115 year plus period of time, the Carnegie Foundation has grown to be a place where innovative ideas are developed, they're prototyped, they're tested, they're refined, and when they seem to have value to the field of education, we give them to the field and find homes for them and places where they can be maintained in perpetuity. And there have, over the years, been numerous examples of this that have influenced education both in the United States but also throughout the entire world. Very early on, something called the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association, TIAA, which is today the world's largest retirement management system for folks who work in, um, who work in teaching, who work in not-for-profit environments, who work as researchers, for people who do good work for the benefit of mankind. We also have developed the Carnegie Unit, the measure through which progress through higher, ed, higher education is routinely monitored throughout much of the world, in fact. Uh, the Flexner Report revised and transformed medical education from a 200-year-old system of one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship into the system that we have today with medical colleges associated with teaching hospitals because it recognized that there was a body of knowledge that all practitioners in medicine needed to have and have access to if we were going to give the kind of health care that people needed going forward. Since then, other things like the Carnegie classifications, which is widely used in many places throughout the world to cluster together like institutions in higher education, as well as even the United States Department of Education uh, owes its early beginnings to advocacy and work done at the Carnegie Foundation. And most recently, under the leadership of the president immediately preceding Tony Breich, who you'll hear from in just a few moments, um, a focus on the scholarship of teaching, learning about teaching as complement to learning from a research-based perspective. And then most recently, We've been working on the adaptation of improvement sciences to effectively address problems in education. And that's what we want to spend most of our time focused on with you today. One of the things you will hear from Dr. Tony and myself is that good improvement work begins by understanding the problem and tailoring your responses from that recognition of the problem and the system in which the problem resides, 
which is the system in which solutions, if they're going to be successful and be improvements, have to thrive. So you begin by studying the problem, and that's where I want to begin. First of all, we note that all available data, including international uh, assessment of student learning, demonstrate that over the past decades, the performance of our schools have been steadily improving and steadily increasing. Yet at the same time, society, the world's needs, even individual and collectively, have also been increasing, and the demands for our schools have increased. Things such as climate challenges, most recently, as you know as well as any of us, the challenges of the pandemic and others have driven forcefully the message that if students are to, be, are to lead full, healthy, and rewarding and fulfilling lives, what we need from our schools has also been growing and will also continue to grow, even rap more rapidly than our improvements have grown. And as a result, there is a growing chasm, a gap between how our schools perform and what it is we want and need from them in order to best serve individuals and society. And what we have been doing is coming up with ideas, programs, uh, innovations, initiatives, and throwing these ideas at the problem of school improvement, at the issue of enhancing the performance of our schools. And the challenge is that many of these ideas, and they can be very, very good and wonderful ideas, but often these ideas do not succeed when you move them from one place to another. Often these ideas do not prove to be improvements when brought from one environment and one context into another. And that has caused us to realize that we need to rethink the challenge of school improvement. It is not just about dictating behaviors. It's not just about insisting on fidelity of implementation, giving people an idea, an idea, a program, and saying, do exactly what this program says or requires. Instead, what we need to do is confront two big questions. And these are the questions that improvement science and education are designed to address. First of all, how can we help our educational organizations, be that the classroom, the school, the school district, or the system beyond? How can we help these organizations continuously get better at what they do? Because that is the nature of the challenge ahead. And secondly, how do we accelerate learning to improve, both on the complex problems that have challenged us for decades, that challenge us today, as well as challenges that we cannot even anticipate right now, but we can be assured that they are there and they will materialize in the time to come. And so, what I want to do is turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Tony, who will give us the, uh, a quick overview of the elements of the improvement science that we recommend as the way to address those two big ideas. His Highness, I'd like to begin with a thank you. As a first-time visitor to Sarja, I have been overwhelmed with the warmth and generosity and good spirit of everyone whom we have met here. Uh, I feel truly welcomed and feel truly honored to be in this community of educators. So thank you. Um, Paul has set the context for why we brought about the introduction of these ideas of improvement science and improvement communities into education. I'd like to begin my remarks by talking a little bit about my own personal journey into this work, how I got to lead this work, I have a lot of microphones here, uh, at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. It started in 1985 when uh, I was appointed as a professor at the University of Chicago. And I've spent most of my life as an academic in research universities all across the United States. Here I was in this very prestigious research university surrounded by 
some of the most troubled communities and schools that you'd find anywhere in the United States. Uh, I had this sense that those of us who lived in the university could and should stand in a more productive relationship to improving teaching and learning and the organizations in which this work occurred. But exactly how? That was my personal learning journey. This quest took me to work directly with networks of teachers, principals, school leaders, parents, and community members in some of Chicago's poorest neighborhoods. It led to collaborations with uh, educators and researchers involved in improving ele elementary school instruction and improving high school graduation. It led me to understand the centrality of work in supporting principal leaders of our schools and in strengthening the development of, of uh, new teachers to enter our school communities. All of these things were essential if we were to better succeed in improving educational opportunities. At the core of my work while I was in Chicago was building a research and analytic capacity to inform an incredible array of reform efforts that were ongoing in the city of Chicago while I was there. Our aim was to bring trustworthy evidence to all involved in these improvement efforts so that they could understand better what changes we were introducing, whether these changes were improvements, for whom and under what set of circumstances, and not an occasion when they weren't working to understand that too and why they weren't working. Our task in simplest terms was to support a whole city as it learned to improve its schools. Shortly after I started on this work in 1987, the then US Secretary of Education, uh, Bill Bennett, described Chicago as the worst public school system in the United States. There was some debate as to whether it was actually the worst, but regardless, it was clearly a troubled context. This is some data that was developed by a former colleague of mine, Sean Reardon, a professor at, at uh, Stanford University. Each one of the little circles in this display represents the outcome for a district in the United States. It represents the amount of learning that's occurring during a year of instruction in grades three through eight. That red circle is where Chicago was in 1990, 0.8 years of learning for a year of instruction. So we had very poor children typically coming into the school system and they were falling behind a little bit more year by year. This is where the work started in 1990. 25 years later, Chicago now stood as one of the most improving public school systems in the United States, where in Reardon's research, he documented that in Chicago, students were now learning 1.2 years of learning for a year of instruction. So this was really part of the journey, of how to get from 1990 to 2016. These are kind of results, these are results for elementary schools, but the improvement wasn't limited to only elementary schools. There was also improvement occurring at the high school level as well. When this work began, Typically in the Chicago public schools, about half the students who started high school graduated. That typically was a cohort of about 20,000 students. So every year, 10,000 students approximately were dropping out of high school. That's what the results looked like in the early 1990s, and they tracked back for decades like that. Beginning in the early 2000s, as these improvement efforts were going forward, High school graduation rates started to rise, and now they exceed 80% in the city of Chicago. And our learning from all this work was captured in this book, Learning to Improve, and we have copies of this for each of you uh, so that you can take it with you when you leave today. It is... Um, while I was in Chicago and I was doing this work, I was sort of, quite honestly, learning by doing, trying to figure out how the resources in the university could become of value to educators in school communities 
in their day-to-day -day work of trying to improve teaching and learning and the ways in which educators engaged parents, students, and their local communities. As I came to the, as I took on the role of president of the foundation in 2008, I had the opportunity to join with Paul, other colleagues at the foundation, including Jojo and I, whom you'll have a chance to hear from later today. And it was in the context of the foundation that we began to formalize this set of understandings about how educators could more systematically improve the outcomes of their efforts day to day, and that is captured in learning to improve. What I'd like to do is now just briefly introduce to you the six core principles that organize this activity. It starts with this idea of organizing in networks. And that begins with a very simple observation. The education systems that we've built over the years and the challenges that we now confront, that rising, that expanding chasm between what we can deliver day to day and what we would like to be able to deliver day to day. These are problems so large and complex that few of us could actually solve them alone. We need to work together. We need to form these networked communities, bringing our collective capacities together, that we can accomplish more together than even the best of us could accomplish alone. So it starts with this idea of organizing as networks. Second principle is this idea of focusing in on a specific problem to solve. What Paul alluded to in his opening remarks is that as we confront these challenges, we have ideas for new programs and new, and new policies, but we rarely stop and take a step back and say, what is the challenge that we're actually trying to solve? What is actually, and then, so being very problem focused, and to understand those problems, to actually get inside of them, to be able to understand them in the ways that teachers and students and, edu and those engaged in school communities are experiencing them every day. We call that being user-centered, seeing the problem through the eyes of the people who are living it every day, rather than through my academic eyes or some other policy set of ideas. So being problem-centered, problem-focused, and user-centered. In doing that work, what we're, we're about is we're developing a working theory of improvement. And that working theory is anchored in seeing how the system currently works. Why do people do the work the way they do it every day? How have we constructed an environment around them that encourages them to work that way? Seeing that system, what kind of out, what variability and outcome it produces, because that is where improvement starts by understanding the system that's currently producing the outcomes we get. The next step in the work then is to become, is to become disciplined in the actual improvement work, to begin to develop this working theory. Uh, it's a shared theory that a whole community is now working within. We also are collecting some common data so that we can learn together from the different changes that we introduce whether these changes are actually improvements. So we're bringing a very disciplined inquiry approach. We are acting like scientists. We're posing hypotheses about what we think will actually get us to closing that chasm. We're trying some things, and then we're asking, how do we know whether that change we introduced is actually an improvement? So that's where gathering data and constantly testing our changes against evidence comes in. So, that's bringing this idea of discipline, inquiry into it. And then there's a, a deliberate effort to accumulate this practical knowledge because we now have a network all working together trying to solve a common problem. People in different places are trying different things. We're accumulating this. We're testing very rapidly. The best of that, we're pushing back out so that others can test and try it in their locations. And what we're, we're basically trying to do is to accelerate the learning around improvement by tapping the wisdom of everyone engaged in trying to solve a problem together. So that brings us to this idea of active social learning. I'm now going to pass it back to Paul, who's going to talk a little quickly about how we've tried to apply these principles in one large problem-solving context 
uh, in our community colleges in the United States. I'm going to spend just a few moments closing with how this all looks when you put it together into a concerted, organized effort. First of all, to help us organize our thinking, note that there are really two big ideas here. The first of these are the, is the idea about improvement science, a methodology for making ideas work, for making sure that what can be successful actually is successful in other contexts, uh, for everyone, for every time, and as we like to put it, to ensure that good ideas get implemented effectively so that they have the impact you desire, reliably so that they can do that over and over and over again, and at scale so that it can happen every time, every place, and for everyone. That is the essential challenge. It's not that we lack good ideas, it's that we lack a method to make sure that good ideas work properly when we bring them to new settings and try to get them to work. And that's the essence of what improvement science does for us. And the second big idea is to integrate improvement science with the power of networks. Human collectives that represent a unique environment in which to do improvement work, to foster and accelerate learning using these methods. Networks offer many, many things, not least of which is the simple observation that collectively in networks we can do more than any of us can do individually for sure. And that in a network large enough, whatever problem we may be working on, there is knowledge about how best to address it. So I want to talk about how these ideas got put to work in just one quick example that I'll walk through with for you. The first, and, and, and the nature of the problem, as you heard me say, and then you heard Tony say afterward, it begins by understanding the problem uh, and rooting your ideas about improvement in that understanding of the problem and the system that currently harbors the problem. And the problem that we want to talk about is very, very poor graduation rates in community colleges, which quickly, as we an analyzed it, came down to the simple fact that large numbers, extremely large numbers, unconscionably large numbers of students were not successfully acquiring the mathematics credit that they needed at the college level in order to be successful, in order to realize their ambitions at whether they were to attain a degree, to transfer to a four-year granting, degree-granting institution, or whether it was to um, maybe uh, earn some credential in a technical area, all of which require college-level mathematics. And 67, 60 to 70% of students in the United States entering into community colleges are identified and as being in need of remedial, or what is referred to as developmental math, in order before they can move into college-level mathematics. Of these, 80% of those students never, ever achieve college-level mathematics cred uh, credits. This is over 500,000 students every single year that are shut off from their ambitions. This is what, as one of our colleagues has referred to it, where dreams go to die. That's the nature of the problem that we wanted to confront. And we knew that if we continued to do what we've always done, which is no more than what was happening at the time, uh, we're going to continue to get what we've always gotten. We needed something new. We needed a new approach, not just a new program, because what we've always done is to throw programs at this problem. We needed improvement science in networks. And so we began by studying the course, studying the system. We studied, for example, the sequence of courses that people took. We noted that in reality, oops, let me, we noted that um, uh, large numbers of students dropped out in between the courses that were the core sequence of mathematics. We also learned that many students didn't understand why. Algebra in particular was focused on rote activity, procedural activity, simply repeating and drilling and practicing at formulas and the like. We also learned that the nature of instruction was not in keeping to engage students 
and to have them learn the things and learn in the way that they need to in order to learn best that which is relevant to their lives. And as a result, we had a very serious motivation problem that students did not see themselves as belonging in these courses. Did not, they did not see themselves as mathematics people, math students, math types, if you'd like. And so they lacked engagement. In lacking in engagement, they lacked the motivation to actually persevere and succeed. This is the nature of the problem and the nature of the system. And it's much bigger than just having the right new curriculum could possibly address. And so we built a theory of improvement. And you see the essential elements. First of all, we needed to make changes in the instructional system. We needed to work on the problem of, human, uh, of, of student motivation, engagement, therefore effort, therefore success. We needed to work on issues of literacy because language was a barrier to many students to learn this content and to learn to apply and use it well. And finally, we needed to provide the kind of learning opportunities that would allow teachers to grow, develop, and use all of these elements, whether it was the new instructional system, the new curriculum, or whether it was the student motivation piece. They needed to know how to work on this. A large network made up of 19 colleges throughout the United States in 13 different states went to work on this problem. Each college worked in a different place, a different part of this theory of improvement. I'm going to track just one of them. Well, you see that the work on what we call productive persistence or student engagement and effort and motivation uh, led to the realization that the beginning of the course was an extremely critical time that could predict whether or not folks stayed engaged, succeeded, ultimately got the credit that they were looking for. And so we started to build tools and methods and routines into the first four weeks of the class. We tested them in the class. We worked with teachers on the front line to figure out what ideas had potential, to figure out how to refine those ideas until they were successful in many different contexts, and from that, a package of change ideas that we referred to as the Starting Strong package came into existence for dissemination throughout the network. Imagine a network this large, and this is just one set of colleges working on one part of this problem. Imagine that the same is happening on all of the other parts of this problem, so that the folks who are working on productive persistence can contribute to the entire network what they are learning, even as they anticipate and receive from the rest of the network important learning about the instructional system, the, li the literacy questions, and so on. This is what we mean when we say, by working in networks, we can accelerate learning and, 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 and greatly enhance the impact. So what did it all add up to? Well. In just two short years of working in this way, 100 students to compare to what the traditional sequence and the traditional approach would have given us, uh, 100 students one year out, uh, only 6% of them had completed the required math sequence. Two years out, 15% had been successful. Whereas with the approach that we are talking about, the use of improvement science in networks, in just one year, 51% were able to complete their sequence and get the required credentials to move on with their education. That is three times the success, more than three times the success in half of the time. And these effects just continue after this in the form of increased graduation rates, increased earnings upon graduation, increased transfer rates into four-year programs, and the like. So I want to conclude just by saying, offering a word or two about what this all adds up to in our view. And I should tell you that in order to do that, and in preparing to speak with you this morning, I had occasion to look at some stuff that I wrote a very long time ago. Over 35 years ago, I wrote something on a different topic that I think really applies here that I wanted to share with you. And apart from the fact that it is full of the kind of bravado and uh, uh, innocent enthusiasm of a young man, I think it actually applies in some ways too. I wrote back then, if you want to make change that people take notice of, is highly visible, is 
is, is, is loud and people make note of it, implement big programs. But understand that those programs will exist only as long as their sponsorship exists. That those programs will endure only as long as you are around to make sure that they stay and they stay alive. So if you want to make change that is deep, widespread, and long-lasting, change the way people think about their problems and how to address their problems. To us, this is what Improvement Science and Networks does. It changes the way people think about their problems, who engages with them, what responsibilities they have, and it does so in some of these ways. First of all, it represents a shift from implementing fast and scaling wide, or as we sometimes cynically refer to it, go big and hope for the best. It represents a shift from that to learning fast to implement well. It represents a shift from focusing on average effects to focusing on variability. Things are not an improvement unless things get better for everyone. Uh, innocent enthusiasm of a young man, I think it actually applies in some ways too. I wrote back then, if you want to make change that people take notice of, is highly visible, is, 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 is loud and people make note of it, implement big programs. But understand that those programs will exist only as long as their sponsorship exists. That those programs will endure only as long as you are around to make sure that they stay and they stay alive. So if you want to make change that is deep, widespread, and long-lasting, change the way people think about their problems and how to address their problems. To us, this is what Improvement Science and Networks does. It changes the way people think about their problems, who engages with them, what responsibilities they have, and it does so in some of these ways. First of all, it represents a shift from implementing fast and scaling wide, or as we sometimes cynically refer to it, go big and hope for the best. It represents a shift from that to learning fast to implement well. It represents a shift from focusing on average effects to focusing on variability. Things are not an improvement unless things get better for everyone. Efforts that increase the, main, the, the mean in which on average groups do better but leave many behind are not improvements in our view. It also represents a shift from what works, simply saying research proves that this works, you should do exactly what this says to do, to learning how to make things work because that's what we lack. We don't lack good ideas, and we don't lack ideas that can work. What we lack is a, to, is a method to learn how they work and to make sure that they work. It represents a shift from scripting things to every, stu every situation, every teacher is unique. The age-old argument between whether or not education is a science or an art, to a shift to developing quality processes to support complex work, because we can all agree is that teaching is indeed complex work. And we need to have routines to test, develop uh, processes that support that. It represents finally uh, our next a shift from uh, individual autonomy as a prize norm to working together in order to accomplish more. And the last one, which is, I will say frankly, is very, very important to me personally as a researcher of many, many years. It represents a shift from a schism in practice and, 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 and education that we've had for many, many years, a, divi a division between those who are knowers and those who are doers, those who produce knowledge and those who are supposed to use that knowledge with, I have to say, a hierarchically strongly implied by that distinction between knowers and doers, knowledge producers and knowledge users. What it does is it represents a shift to everyone as producers and users of knowledge. That if improvement is going to happen, we must all step up to our responsibility and accept our professional responsibility to both produce knowledge about how to improve and to use that knowledge about improving. In that way, we can produce change and improvement that is indeed deep, widespread, and enduring. Thank you.
شكرا لسعادة البروفيسور بول لومايو وسعادة البروفيسور أنتوني بريكر على ما تفضل به وعبر التقنية الرقمية ندعو سعادة البروفيسور تيموثي نولز رئيس مؤسسة كارنيدي ليلقي كلمته فليتفضل مشكورا Assalamu alaikum. Greetings to your highness, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi, Excellency Dr. Muhaditha, Excellency Dr. Janine, Dr. Humada, and all our colleagues in education, the principals, teachers, and educators of Sharjah. It's a tremendous pleasure to join you. I wish I could be there in person and very much hope I will have the opportunity to join you soon. Fortunately, you're joined by some of our remarkable colleagues from the Foundation, including Tony Bright, our former president, one of our nation's greatest education scholars, and the person who brought improvement science to the field of education. Paul LeMahieu, our executive vice president, and one of the wisest, most curious, generous educators with whom I've had the privilege to work and Jojo Manai, our Managing Director for All Things Technology, and also an expert sailor, so you're in good hands. I grew up in a small village in England with three main attributes, a sweet shop, a duck pond, and a school. My parents were professors at Oxford so managed over time to convince me that school was actually more important than the sweet shop and the duck pond. When I was nine, my family and I moved to the United States. As my parents had been offered new posts at a place I hadn't heard of called Harvard. It was an exciting prospect for a young boy from rural England. I was most looking forward to encountering cowboys, which I had been told by a friend I would find everywhere. And I was deeply concerned about bank robbers. Since then, I have worked on improving schools in communities where young people depend on the quality of schooling the most. I've worked across the United States and in Africa, and my work has focused on creating institutions, methods of teaching and learning, and organizing systems of schools so young people, even those from the poorest communities, can thrive in school and lead dignified and purposeful careers. At Carnegie, our work is focused on four main vectors. First, on improvement science. What I hope will distinguish the work over the next 10 years is that we find more robust ways to introduce improvement science at broad scale and collaborate with new partners to build the global improvement movement so we're joining you here because of our shared interest in applying improvement site methods to create exemplary schooling across Sharjah and beyond. In the United States, Carnegie is sharply focused on improving educational attainment, secondary and tertiary school completion, the most persuasive social science in the world, as I'm sure you know draw straight lines between educational attainment and things that truly matter, like longer lifespan. In the United States, there's literally a nine-year difference in lifespan between those who finish secondary school and those who do not. And the higher your educational attainment, the higher your lifetime earnings, the better your health outcomes, the more you participate in civic activities like voting and giving blood and volunteering. And the higher your level of educational attainment, the more likely it is your children will have higher levels of educational attainment. So improving secondary and tertiary attainment is literally the gift that gives for generations. With partners across the United States, the Foundation is embarking on a project to improve secondary and post-secondary completion at national scale, an initiative designed to change the trajectory of millions of lives. 
Another strategic priority for Carnegie is to focus on the post-secondary sector itself, on institutions of higher education. For Carnegie, this means working on several fronts. First, we're supporting the development of new models of post-secondary education. For example, we're partnered with the African Leadership University, ALU. ALU has designed an incredibly elegant institution that aims to educate 3.5 million ethical and entrepreneurial leaders from across the African continent. Unlike most institutions, ALU is not measuring success based on exclusivity, how many people they reject. They're measuring success based on inclusivity, how many young people they educate and the impact their graduates have on society. Carnegie is also rethinking some of our historic contributions. For example, for nearly 50 years, the foundation has classified institutions of higher education across the United States. Every post-secondary institution in the US receives a Carnegie classification. Some of you may have heard of R1 or Research One institutions, the top tier of the university system in the United States. We're developing a new suite of Carnegie classifications that will define academic prestige based on how well institutions propel students to and through school and into purposeful careers. In essence, instead of defining prestige based on institutional assets, we aim to define quality based on institutional impact. Our final body of work is in many ways the most ambitious. And from my perspective, as a former teacher, principal, school district leader, it is the most urgent. At Carnegie, we call it the future of learning. One of the things that the foundation brought the world was the Carnegie unit. In common parlance, the Carnegie unit is the credit power, or the course credit, the measure that standardized public education in the United States. To be clear, the, the foundation established the Carnegie unit at the turn of the last century. That's the last century before airplanes, way before computers, and before 99% of the globe even had access to electricity. And since that time, the Carnegie unit has become the bedrock currency of the educational economy across the globe. It's central to the vast majority of high schools, of how they're organized, and how colleges are organized. It determines what we count as learning. It shapes what is and is not assessed. In the United States, it defines who is and who is not eligible for financial aid. It is foundational to what goes on a transcript, and it's a primary proxy for many employers to determine whether new job candidates are career ready. Put simply, the Carnegie unit isn't just hardwired into the educational system, it is the system. At its heart, the Carnegie unit is the conflation of time and learning. It defines knowledge based on the number of minutes we spend in a classroom. This is problematic for many reasons. Two stand out to me. First, it ignores the vast amount that has been learned over the last 50 years from neuroscientists, cognitive and social psychologists, and the learning sciences about how people learn through immersive experiences, by solving real problems from peers, experts, mentors, and at highly variable rates depending on the individual and the subject of study. Second, the ubiquity of the Carnegie unit, the rootedness of it throughout the educational enterprise has had a pernicious effect on the pace and scale and efficacy of educational progress. Of course, there have always been alternative ideas and models, Dewey and Montessori at the turn of the last century, and many small scale efforts across the education field today. But the problem is, these examples exist at the edges of the system, not the center of it. They are the deviation and not the rule. To be fair, the Carnegie unit standardized 
schooling 115 years ago, when there was literally no standard. And at its time, it was a transformative idea. However, simplistic, time-bound constructions of what knowledge is and how it's acquired are no longer contributive. Students, teachers, educators, parents are not being well served. We need a new educational architecture that promotes teaching and learning that is inspiring, accelerative, rigorous, equitable, experiential, competency-based, and allows learning to take place anywhere. So, at the foundation, we're working on building new versions of the Carnegie Unit. But to return to where I started, making progress on any of these bodies of work is dependent on our learning to improve. That's why improvement science is the instrumental variable. Improvement science starts by understanding deeply the problems we face and the systems in which those problems exist so that we don't just throw sometimes irrelevant solutions at the problems we're trying to solve. And improvement science redefines roles and relationships to benefit from the knowledge, the skills, and the expertise of all of us working together, students, teachers, principals, and education leaders, to solve our problems. And for those reasons, it has proven to be effective, helping us to make real progress in addressing long-standing and sometimes seemingly unsolvable problems. I'm thrilled that we're opening the door to a partnership with Sharjah to work together on problems that matter to you, to work together collaboratively as Sharjah, the Emirates as a whole, and the region get even better at getting better. Thank you very much. شكرا لسعادة البروفيسور تيموثي نولز على ما تفضل به صاحب السمو لقد منحتم هذه الأكاديمية لأبنائنا الطلبة والطالبات والمعلمين والمعلمات لنستثمر فيهم ونسلمهم الراية ليرفعوها عاليا واسمح لنا يا صاحب السمو أن ندعو الطالب أحمد المرزوقي طالب المرحلة الثانوية في مدرسة الشارقة الأبريكية الدولية ليحدثنا عن تجربته في أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين حضرة صاحب السمو الشيخ الدكتور سلطان بن محمد القاسمي حفظكم الله ورعاكم أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الحضور الكريم إنه لشرف عظيم لي أن أقف هنا اليوم لا بصفة أحمد محمد سلمان المرزوقي طالب الصف الحادي عشر في مدرسة الشارقة الأمريكية الدولية وحسب وإنما بصفة صوت الشباب الذين أشار إليهم صاحب السمو الشيخ خليفة بن زايد آن نهيان رحمه الله وطيب ثراه بثروة الأمة اسمحوا لي يا صاحب السمو أن أعرب عن عظيم الامتنان والتقدير لمنحنا هذه الفرصة لنكون جزءا لن يتجزأ في مسيرة أكاديمية الشارقة التعليمية في القطاع التعليمي صاحب السمو تتمثل مهمة أكاديمية الشارقة في تنمية الفرد أكاديميا واجتماعيا ويتماشى ذلك مع مئوية الإمارات لعام 2071 التي تكرس جهودها لإعداد جيل يحمل راية المستقبل ويفتخر بأعلى المعايير العلمية والمهنية والقيم الأخلاقية والإيجابية لضمان الاستمرارية وتأمين مستقبل وحياة أفضل للأجيال القادمة الأمر الذي من شأنه أن يعزز مكان دولة الإمارات كوحدة من أفضل دول العالم صاحب السمو لقد شاركت مع مجموعة من زملائي في إحدى دورات أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم خلال فترة الجائحة وأتيحت لنا الفرصة لإيصال ما تعلمناه إلى مجتمعنا المدرسي مما عزز مهاراتنا في التواصل وقدراتنا على حل المشكلات بالإضافة إلى تنمية وعينا تجاه القضايا التي تصيب العالم إن الاجتماعات التي عقدناها في الأكاديمية والمحادثات التي أجريناها هنا والنتائج التي توصلنا إليها تعزز أهمية الدور الذي تقوم به الأكاديمية 
في إعداد جيل متعلم ومعلم صاحب السمو نيابة عن جميع طلبة الشارقة شكرا لسموكم شكرا لهيئة الشارقة للتعليم الخاص شكرا لأكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم شكرا لكل مهني تربوي هنا اليوم يطمح إلى دفع هذا القطاع ومدارسنا إلى حيث القمم تعليمنا جواز سفرنا للعالمية وللغد الأفضل والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا يا أحمد صاحب السمو اليوم تطلق أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم منصة الشارقة التعليمية لكي تخدم المعلمين في جميع أنحاء العالم وتوفر لهم مجتمعا تعليميا في الفضاء الرقمي ولتوفر أحدث التقنيات وتكنولوجيا التعليم المزودة بالذكاء الاصطناعي لتكون منصة تمكين للمعلمين والمتعلمين ليكونوا مبدعين ومسؤولين وقياديين متعاونين لتحقيق التقدم المستدام في قطاع التعليم لبناء مستقبل مشرق والآن اسمح لنا يا صاحب السمو أن ندعوك للتفضل بإطلاق المنصة الشارقة التعليمية منصة حاضنة للبيان رؤاها وارفة أخصان قيمها راسخة كالبنيان مهاراتها ندية كالريحان تمضي سامقة في خطى سلطان رجل الثقافة والعلم والإحسان وبكم تزدان وتسمو في أمان شكرا يا صاحب السمو تعجز الكلمات عن حمل معاني الشكر والامتنان لكم وتتسابق قلوبنا وألسنتنا للدعاء لكم فجزاكم الله كل خير ونرجو من المولى عز وجل أن يوفقنا لأن نكون عند حسن ظنكم ونطلب منك يا صاحب السمو مباركة سموكم توقيع اتفاقية التعاون مع مؤسسة كارنيجي للنهوض بالتعليم في خطوة تعد واحدة من أهم الخطوات الداعمة للمسيرة التأهيلية والتمكينية للقطاع, التعلي... للقطاع التعليمي خطوة غايتها جعل أكاديمية الشارقة للتعليم مركزا مختصا للنهوض بالتعليم المدرسي على المستويين المحلي والعالمي <تصفيق> 